wonderful world of cinema has delighted audiences around the world for over a century, allowing moviegoers to experience untold visual riches. But just as integral as the visual is to the experience of film, the sound and music is just as important. Join us on today's educational program as we examine the movie tie-in song from its capitalist conception to its glorious peak. Christina, Messi, how about we have a little Oscar-licious fun up in this joint? You might not ever get rich For the purposes of this video, a movie tie-in song is one that is closely associated with a given film. It might be one that a character sings, it might occur in the film's universe, it might be played over a scene, or it might be used to promote the film prior to its release, or all of the above. This means that we won't be talking about scores or sound design unless their history is relevant. Also, I'll be looking at these songs and their impact in the United States mainly, so no Bollywood today. Let's travel all the way back to the early 1900s. Teddy Roosevelt was president, the primary way of listening to music was the 78, and all films had the same soundtrack. Here it is now. <laughs> Film technology hadn't yet advanced to the point of having, you know, sound, so theaters would hire pianists or small bands to provide music during the film. Not only did this help keep audiences engaged, but it also covered up the sound of the projector, which could get loud. These musicians would play from scores of photoplay music, and each piece would be meant for a given emotion or object on screen. You see an airplane, play this piece. See someone crying, play this. So on and so forth. This morphed into cue sheets, which were pieces of music intended for one scene in one movie. Imagine that. At the same time, the groups that would perform during movies grew to be as large as a full-on orchestra. These two developments came to a head in 1915, when the first ever score compiled specifically for one movie's entire run time debuted with D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. For various reasons, the film was a rousing success. It was also Fast forward to 1927 and Al Johnson's The Jazz Singer is released with its landmark Vitaphone system, marking the first time you were able to watch a film with your ears and hear it with your eyes, just as God intended. From there, film studios capitalized on this by making movies that rubbed this new technology right in your face. In other words, musicals. As we move into the 30s, tons of famous movie songs had their origins here. Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz, Singing in the Rain from Hollywood Review, Old Man River from Showboat, Cheek to Cheek from Top Hat. Though these songs were big hits at the time, movie studios didn't really see the value of the work done by composers, who then could only work for one studio at a time. Meanwhile, King Kong is released in 1933 with the first ever soundtrack written specifically for one film. This is also when we saw the first commercially released soundtrack for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The soundtrack was called Songs from Walt Disney, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, with the same characters and sound effects as in the film of that title. Who wrote that, Fiona Apple? Jumping to the late 40s and early 50s, audiences got to hear movie songs like As Time Goes By, made famous in Casablanca, White Christmas from Holiday Inn, zippa dee doo -Dah from Song of the South. Actually, you might remember this Disney film because it's... But in 1952 comes the godfather of the movie tie-in song. But not like from the godfather. Composer Dmitry Tiomkin was brought on to handle the music for the 1952 western film High Noon. Along with the score, director Stanley Kramer asked him to write a folk tune corresponding to the film's themes. Tiomkin gave him Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, otherwise known as The Ballad of High Noon, which would be sung by Tex Ritter. Kramer loved the song enough to put it in multiple scenes of the film, but test audiences found it too jokey for the movie, and the studio pressured Kramer to remove it. Instead, as the film was in post-production limbo, Kramer went to Columbia Records to have a rendition by Frankie Lane recorded and released. The studio retaliated by releasing Ritter's version as a single under Capitol Records. In the months following the film's release in July 1952, both versions became huge hits, landing in the Billboard Top 20. The film itself was also a huge hit, selling out theaters and winning multiple Oscars, including one for Best Original Song. And the winner is... 
Dimitri Tiomkin for High Noon. It was at this time that studios realized the power of movie tie-in songs to connect with audiences and to build another way to express the themes within a movie and also make money. Did I, did I forget the money part? <laughs> After High Noon's success, studios began to use the soundtracks and songs from films as a marketing device. Musicals such as South Pacific, Gigi, and West Side Story benefited from having songs released before the movie, like America, Some Enchanted Evening, and Thank Heaven for Little Girls. Wow, someone definitely named that song. The increased popularity of rock and roll also impacted movie soundtracks. In some instances, they just brought in rock stars to star in and provide music for films, like Elvis Presley and The Beatles. In other instances, they brought in existing popular music to create a certain aesthetic. Blackboard Jungle is considered the first successful movie to use pre-existing music for aesthetic purposes. However, it's not the one that popularized the technique for narrative purposes. But that's something we'll get into later. And later is now. Hello, darkness, my old friend. In 1967, The Graduate was released, featuring a soundtrack composed of Dave Grusin's original score and songs by Simon and Garfunkel. What's special about SNG's contribution is that it was a mix of original songs for the film, like Mrs. Robinson, and previously released songs like The Sounds of Silence. What's interesting about Dave Grusin's score is that there isn't really much of one. Most of his work is incidental music, so Simon and Garfunkel ended up soundtracking most of the major moments in the film. The film released a substantial acclaim and made household names out of the folk duo. About two years later, Easy Rider, the classic 1969 film that kickstarted the era of New Hollywood, had a soundtrack entirely comprised of pre-existing songs. Though the songs were originally in place as a temp soundtrack, they ended up feeling so integral that the duo behind the movie, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda, decided to keep them all in. This led to the soundtrack costing about $1 million, while the rest of the movie only cost about $350,000. Both The Graduate and Easy Rider exemplified the best case scenario when it comes to using pre-existing music as a soundtrack. When it worked, it could be beneficial for artists, since it could bring notoriety and allow existing songs to gain a second wind of popularity, studios, since licensing songs was cheaper than having a full original score at the time, and audiences, who could feel a stronger connection to what was occurring on screen because of the song's use. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Movie songs in the 1970s reflected the fractured state of the film industry at the time, which was split between smaller, independent films and the newly created blockbusters. Films like American Graffiti went with a compilation of pre-existing tunes, artists like Curtis Mayfield and Isaac Hayes were brought on to compose soundtracks for Superfly and Shaft respectively, The Who saw two of their albums turned into films, Tommy in 1975 and Quadrophenia in 1979, and of course we had the return of Golden Age Hollywood scoring with all the... And also the... And don't forget the... Right at the end of the 70s, though, two films managed to redefine the entire movie soundtrack landscape, demonstrate the power of movie songs to sell tickets and captivate audiences, and help guide the cultural aesthetic away from the muddy, confused 70s and towards the bright, boisterous 80s. Here's a hint. They both star John Travolta. The soundtrack for 1977 Saturday Night Fever, primarily composed by the Bee Gees, was an absolute monstrous success. As of this video, it's been certified 16 times platinum in the States and has sold over 54 million copies. It was even the first soundtrack to win Album of the Year at the Grammys. Though it helped the film become a massive hit, it also became a defining album of the disco era. And then... This is the main brain, Vince Fontaine, beginning your day with the only way. Music, music, music. Released less than a year later, the musical film Grease was another smash hit for Travolta. Oh, and it had some songs too. Two of them, the title track and You're the One That I Want, were number one hit songs. The soundtrack as a whole was the second best-selling album of 1978. What was the first, you ask? Oh, hello. What followed Saturday Night Fever and Grease was the most prosperous time for movie soundtracks and songs in all of film history. If you have a favorite movie song, chances are it came from this era. The 80s had songs like Eye of the Tiger from Rocky III, Don't You Forget About Me from The Breakfast Club, Danger Zone and Take My Breath Away from Top Gun, the entire Purple Rain soundtrack. Movie songs from this decade were especially focused on being marketing tools, to the extent that many of them were just named after the movie they were from. What's that song from that Kevin Bacon dancing movie? Footloose. Oh, Footloose. What's that one from the movie with the flashy dancing? 
Oh, Flashdance, what a feeling. What's that one from the Bill Murray ghost movie? Oh, thank you. As we entered the 90s, movie songs expanded from just synth pop bops and into other genres. The ballad was especially prevalent with My Heart Will Go On from Titanic, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing from Armageddon, Kiss from a Rose by Seal. Wait, what? Yeah, Seal's classic R&B ballad was on the soundtrack for Batman Forever. Power, my pleasure, my pain. Rap and hip hop also made their way into movie soundtracks, Gangsta's Paradise from Dangerous Minds and the Sonic movie. Meow. And of course, Men in Black featuring future YouTuber Will Smith. <laughs> the compilation soundtrack also saw plenty of high profile use this decade. Soundtracks for the Batman movies, Space Jam, Pulp Fiction, Singles, Train Spotting. Anything else? Oh, music videos were popular, and several movie songs used them to great effect. They were a cool new way to promote both the song and the movie. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, the Disney Renaissance! Those films had huge soundtracks, plus renditions of their most famous tunes by popular artists. Heck, Phil Collins just did the entire Tarzan soundtrack. We just let him do that. Is that it? Oh yeah, I guess that's all there was. And I... Oh yeah, the Kevin Costner Whitney Houston movie The Bodyguard, which has, as of this video, the highest selling film soundtrack of all time, thanks to I Will Always Love You. There's no definitive reason why this era was so plentiful of memorable movie songs. Based on my research, however, I'd say it's based on a few factors. One, the rise in new listening mediums, such as the cassette and CD, led to people being able to purchase music in a more convenient form. Two, the music industry in general was experiencing the largest boom in sales it had ever seen, so it makes sense that people would spend money to buy the soundtracks for their favorite films. Three, the US economy as a whole was doing obscenely well. The 80s and 90s brought about two of the largest economic expansions in US history. So basically, people had more money to spend than ever, they spent a good amount of it on films, which were doing better than ever, and in turn, the music from those films became very popular. But unfortunately, no period of prosperity can last forever, and in my opinion, the golden age of the movie tie-in song ended around the turn of the century. On the website, he can share his MP3 music library free of charge. Why it ended here is anyone's guess. It may have been digital downloads and piracy leading to the complete fracturing of the music industry, which caused studios to move away from a practice that was no longer financially sound. It may have been Will Smith's Wild Wild West, who knows. That's not to say that movie soundtracks and songs today suck. Many of them have become huge hits. Lose Yourself from 8 Mile, See You Again from Furious 7, Shallow from A Star Is Born, Happy from Despicable Me 2, Heathens from the Academy Award winning Suicide Squad. Do these songs have anything in common? Hmm. Well, they don't typically reference anything from the movie they're from. Like, just from the song lyrics, would you be able to tell that Love Me Like You Do is from Fifty Shades of Grey, or that Happy is from Despicable Me 2, or Can't Stop the Feeling is from Trolls? Sure, sometimes they put the movie title in the song name, but it's not like the 80s where they named the song after the movie to promote it. Speaking of the movie, the genres that spawn tie-in songs can vary wildly. You have your summer blockbusters, your Spider-Mans, both Maguire and Morales, your Furious 7s, your Academy Award-winning Suicide Squad. On the other end, indie films often go the compilation soundtrack route, with some like Garden State, 500 Days of Summer, becoming quite successful. In a few cases, an artist is made executive producer or main curator of a soundtrack. Jay-Z with The Great Gatsby, Lord with Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1, Kendrick Lamar with Black Panther, and Beyonce with The Lion King remake. Musicals are obviously a huge market still, with songs like Lady Marmalade from Moulin Rouge, This Is Me from The Greatest Showman, Let It Go from Frozen. Speaking of which, animated films are another huge market. The Disney musicals, the Lego movies, the Spongebob Squarepants movie, which had Wilco and the shins on it. And the DreamWorks movies, like Madagascar, Shrek, Over the Hedge, which weirdly enough has some of Ben Folds' best songs like ever, and, you know. How about we have a little fun up in this joint? Though the genres and styles have changed, the movie tie-in song serves the same purpose in today's music landscape that it has for 60 years, to help sell movie tickets. And because of that, it's been heavily impacted by the film industry, music industry, and the economy at large. But despite its initial corporate intent, musicians over the years have used the opportunity to write quality songs that have firmly implanted themselves into the pop lexicon. If you have a favorite movie, song, or soundtrack, I would love to know what it is in the comments. And why it's the car wash cover from Shark Tale. <laughs>